Um, so um, I'll talk about fully homomorphic encryption uh, without module switching from classical GAP SVP. Uh, and um, we only have five minutes until lunch, and I'm kind of hungry, so I'll try to make it quick. Um, so uh, let's, let's, uh, let's get going. So I, I, use, I usually think about homomorphic encryption in relation to this problem of, of outsourcing computation. So we have our smartphone, uh, and we want to run uh, all sorts of apps or computational tasks uh, on the smartphone. But you know, the smartphone is not really uh, powerful enough in order to run all these things. Uh, web search, uh, it's not gonna, uh, we're not going to search the web, uh, uh, crawl the web with our smartphone. So we outsource this computation to a cloud server. And this can be modeled by having some input x on the smartphone um, and some function f that uh, our cloud server knows how to compute. And we want to obtain f of x. And the way we usually do it is just by sending our input, uh, I don't know, um, our uh, location and uh, our destination to the server. The server computes the root uh, and sends us back uh, f of x. And uh, this is great. This is how things work. Uh, but what if our, um, but what if we want our input to be private? So uh, for example, we don't want the server, which could be nosy, uh, to know uh, um, our location and our destination. So our goal is to outsource computation in a private manner. And uh, we, wanted, we want to allow the server to compute for us in a blindfolded way, so without knowing what it's computing. So instead of saying, sending our input in the clear, we're just going to encrypt it and send it to the server. And this will guarantee, just by sort of the security of the encryption scheme, that the server learns nothing uh, about, about the input. But that's, that kind of defies the purpose, because how is the server going to compute f of x if it doesn't even know x? Uh, so the server is not going to be able to compute f of x, but rather we're going to require that the server compute some value y, such that this value can later be decrypted on the smartphone to obtain f of x. So this y, in a sense, is an encryption of this value f of x. And this is what homomorphic encryption is all about. So homomorphic encryption is this process uh, that allows you to have an encryption scheme which is semantically secure, and yet, given the description of a function f, and an encryption of all the bits of your input, x1 up to xn, a server which doesn't know what's encrypted inside these ciphertexts can still compute an encryption of f of x. And um, we want to achieve this for any possible function f. And it's uh, fairly straightforward to see that it's sufficient to actually get it only for uh, binary addition and multiplication, because we can just write our function as uh, an arithmetic circuit over, over, over GF2 and just evaluate it gate by gate. So uh, if we get uh, homomorphic evaluation of addition and multiplication, then we get homomorphic evaluation for any function. So this is our goal. So um, let, me, let me tell you what we know. So we'll start with sort of the old days. And like Nigel said, the old days are 2009 until 2011, so really ancient history. Um, so Gentry uh, uh, showed the first candidate uh, uh, fully homomorphic scheme back in 2009. Um, and he actually showed more than that. He showed an outline or a blueprint on how to achieve fully homomorphic encryption. And indeed, the first follow-ups uh, followed this blueprint and sort of instantiated some of the building blocks under different assumptions. Um, an additional scheme by Gentry and Halevi that they called chimeric fully homomorphic encryption uh, showed how to sort of deviate from this blueprint um, and, and remove one of, the, one of the assumptions or the building blocks that Gentry originally had, but at the cost of really complicating the scheme. And I really think that this is, we don't really fully understand uh, this chimeric fully homomorphic, uh, fully homomorphic encryption scheme, but it has some nice idea, but it's very complicated. An additional line of work dealt with trying to make this thing more efficient, uh, more closely, uh, closely uh, more closer to being uh, useful in, in the real world. Um, so, so these were the old days. Uh, and then there's the new, newer schemes uh, that started in work with uh, Vinod Vaikuntanathan, where we showed a scheme that was based on the learning with errors assumption. So learning with errors is related to the problem of approximating short vectors uh, in, in lattices. And this is sort of a better assumption uh, than, than the assumptions that were used in previous schemes. And in particular, uh, you don't need to assume hardness of ideals, which was, um, I guess, implicitly assumed, uh, it was assumed essential uh, somewhat in, in the previous schemes. But uh, uh, this shows that you don't really need uh, these, these hardness of ideals. And perhaps uh, as important, um, the scheme is, has more, a cleaner representation. It's, uh, it's uh, sort of simpler to explain. And this also led to some uh, efficiency improvements. However, shortly after uh, we presented this scheme, um, there was an improvement in, in work with uh, Gendry and Vaikuntanathan, Vaikuntanathan. So this was the basis to uh, um, the uh, implementation that Nigel just presented. 
Um, and this used this, this new magic called module switching. So module switching, I'll, I'll say what it is later. But, but just like that, uh, uh, without doing much, it allowed to get um, to really improve the performance of the scheme. So you got a better assumption. The assumption was still learning with errors, but with much better parameters. Uh, you could get something that you couldn't get before, leveled homomorphism without bootstrapping. So if you don't know what it is, uh, it's sufficient to know that you couldn't get it here and you can get it here. Um, and also, uh, actually, that's somewhat unrelated to module switching. There was also this notion of batching, uh, again, that Nig Nigel mentioned, that led to a sequence of uh, uh, works on um, improving the efficiency, one of which uh, we just saw. Um, so, but I, I'm not going to care about efficiency. All I care about is showing you sort of the simplest uh, um, um, homomorphic encryption scheme that I can. Um, and, and again, the, the, my message is this module switching, uh, this, this magic, um, it, it, gives us, it gives us things for free. And, and uh, what I want to say is this. So uh, module switching is, is a red herring in a sense. Uh, it, if you, uh, you, can, you, can get, you can get the scheme that has, um, that gives you everything that module switching gives you, and actually a little more, without doing it, without doing module switching at all. So if you work, if your scheme works sort of in the right scale, or rather if you bring your scheme to a, scale, to a state where it has no scale, uh, then you can get everything that uh, module switching gives you without really doing it. So you get the same and a little more, in fact, with uh, less headache. Um, so let's see how we do it. So I'll start by describing the scheme of, in this uh, BV paper. And uh, the scheme works as follows. Um, so your secret key is going to be an n-dimensional vector um, over, over ZQ. So Q is going to be a modulus that is going to be unspecified for the, for the most part of the talk. Um, and actually, I, I don't want to think about uh, ZQ in sort of the uh, rigorous mathematical way as uh, you know, uh, a ring of integers modulus, some ideal or something. Just think of ZQ as the integers in the segment minus Q over 2 until plus Q over 2. This is actually going to give a better intuition as to what's going on. Our ciphertext is also going to be uh, a vector over the same, uh, over the same space. And the property of the encryption scheme is that if I take the inner product of um, a ciphertext and the secret key, then what I actually get is the message M that is encrypted by the ciphertext C plus uh, two times small noise, so this is a small even number, plus Q, my modulus, times an integer I. So if you take this thing mod Q, then what you get is that this inner product equals to my message M plus a small even number. So how do I get ciphertext that, that sort of adhere to this equation? It doesn't really matter. If you saw it before, then you know. If you don't, just believe me that this is actually possible, and you can even do it in a public key way. So you don't need to know the secret key in order to generate, uh, in order to encrypt the message M uh, um, such that uh, this equation hold. Um, so uh, encryption is known, and decryption really follows immediately from this equation. So in order to decrypt a ciphertext C, I'm going to uh, compute, is this thing working? Can you even see the, me pointing? No. Yeah, I think it's kind of dead. <laughs> the other one? Oh, this thing? OK, good. We're in business. OK, um, so uh, in order to decrypt, oh, that's, that's actually more more convenient. Why didn't I start with this? Um, so I'm going to compute this inner product, uh, this uh, C inner product with S. I'm going to take it mod Q. So this is going to give me my message M. So M is just one bit. It, it's either z 0 or 1, plus 2 times small noise. And I'm going to take that uh, mod Q, which will give me my original message M. And this is true so long as my noise is not too big so as to cause a wraparound over Q. So, so long as the ratio between the absolute value of the noise and Q is smaller than one quarter, then I get correct, uh, correct decryption. And indeed, I'm going to set my encryption algorithm so that my initial noise is going to be smaller than some bound B, which is much, much smaller than Q. It's going to be alpha times Q for a tiny alpha. But this noise bound is actually going to grow as I, as I do more uh, homomorphic operations. So we need to make sure that we, that we keep our noise smaller than, than this bound. So the scheme I'm, I just presented is going to be secure under the LWE assumption with dimension n modulus q 
and uh, noise rate alpha. So really, we don't care about uh, what these parameters mean. The only thing that I want to say is that the bigger alpha is, the more secure the scheme becomes, because you add more noise, so things become more secure. OK, how do we get homomorphism? So remember, we need to get homomorphism with respect to addition um, mod 2 and with respect to multiplication mod 2. So additive homomorphism, I mean, if we, you saw any talk about it, uh, it's, it all looks the same. You just take two ciphertexts, C1 and C2. C1 encrypts M1, C2 encrypts M2. You add them together. Obviously, from this equation, you're going to get an encryption of M1 plus M2. So not much to do with, with addition, and always the challenge is multiplication. And multiplicative homomorphism is done by, well, multiplying the ciphertext. And specifically, we're going to use tensor product. So we're going to take the tensor product of these two ciphertexts, mod q. And tensor product is going to produce, so tensor product is actually the vector that contains all of the cross terms of the uh, ciphertext C1 and C2. So each of them uh, has uh, um, uh, n elements, and I'm going to take all the possible cross terms, so I get a vector of dim dimension n squared. And I claim that this very long vector actually encrypts the message m1 times m2. Why is that true? So I'm going to say that if you decrypt this ciphertext using an appropriately long secret key, so the secret key is going to be the original secret key tensored with itself, then you're going to get uh, m1 times m2. So this doesn't really go all the way, because uh, we, we got something that may encrypt m1 times m2, but under a different secret key. However, in this BV paper, uh, it is shown how to, how, to get, uh, how to get back to the original secret key. So this is a solved problem. I'm not going to, I'm not going to waste time on it. So why is this true? When I compute the inner product of the tensored uh, ciphertext with the tensored secret key, then just by the definition of tensor product, I get the product of this inner product, C1 inner product with S, times C2 inner product with X. So I'm just going to assign, to, to, uh, uh, um, assign this uh, expression back uh, into the equation at the bottom, and I'm going to get that mod Q, this product equals to M1 plus 2 times E1 times M2 plus 2 times E2. And just by opening the parentheses, I get M1 times M2 plus 2 times something that is in the order of E1 times E2. So indeed, I get, uh, if I apply my decryption algorithm, I will get M1 times M2, but my noise will grow. So the noise uh, magnitude used to be B, but now it's going to be something like B squared. And this can be OK in the beginning when B is small. But if I do it a number of times, then my B is really going to blow up. If I do it D times, and each time my noise squares, then after D times, I'm going to get to a noise that is something like B to the 2 to the D. And um, uh, it's not going to be long until uh, I lose the, crypt I lose the, the cryptability. So um, this is where uh, module switching comes into the play. And module switching actually says that you can bring the noise down simply by dividing the entire ciphertext by a factor b. So we had noise b, we went up to noise b squared, and now we're just going to divide everything by b, and the noise will go back down to b. So this is kind of a stupid idea, but surprisingly it works. Um, so I'm going to start with the ciphertext, and the ciphertext is going to be over zq, and has noise bound uh, b squared. So this is what we got at the end of the multiplication. I'm going to divide by b, and I'm going to get a ciphertext that lives now in z q over b. So my modulus actually got smaller. This is why we call it modulus switching. But the noise also got divided by b, and now my noise bound is just going to be b. So I went back to the original noise bound, but at the cost of reducing the modulus. And of course, we need to be careful uh, so that this division does not harm the message bit. We don't want to lose the information here. Uh, and this is why the special uh, form of rounding here is used uh, in order to make sure that, that your message is preserved. So let's see how it helps us. So let's see how the noise and the modulus evolve as, as we uh, perform multiplications uh, in this uh, 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 using modulus switching. So we start with noise B and modulus Q. After one multiplication, well, we go back to noise B, but our modulus goes down to Q over B, and then we keep going. So our noise uh, will always remain B after uh, each switch, but our modulus is going to go down to Q over B to the D which means that if we want decryptability, then we want b to the d plus 1 to be smaller than q over 4. And this may still be pretty bad, but it's much better than what we had before. Before we had b to the 2 to the d, and now we only have b to the d. So this is a, this is a great improvement. Um, but I'm, I still wasn't happy with, with, uh, with module switching. 
Um, and, and I had two reasons why kind of module switching uh, uh, bothered me. So first of all, module switch, switching is scale dependent. So if I scale both B and Q down by, say, a factor of two, then things actually improve because um, my, my homomorphic properties depend on uh, this expression. And if I scale both B and Q down, then this expression improves. And this shouldn't happen because, I don't know, if I take a step back, then B and Q seem smaller from here. But the scheme remained the same. It shouldn't change. So, so you know, aesthetically, it seems like it shouldn't matter. The, the second reason, which is perhaps related, is that thinking about it, uh, what module switching really does is this. Nothing. Um, I, 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 no, really. I mean, I, I might as well have uh, uh, added another scaling factor during the tensoring process. So instead of taking C1 tensor C2, I could have multiplied it by some tau that would reflect the fact that I'm scaling down my ciphertext. So module switching, switching it, itself shouldn't really buy me anything. And the point is that if I could only get to the correct scale, then the scaling factor should have been one. Uh, and, and this is what I should aspire to. So the solution is uh, um, giving a scale-independent fully homomorphic encryption, which looks like this. Uh, so not to be scared, I'm going to compare it with, with our previous scheme. And this is just taking the, the previous scheme and dividing the ciphertext by Q over two. Actually, in the paper, in the proceedings, I got overzealous and, div and divided by Q and not Q over two, which gives similar results, but now I think that Q over two is sort of the right term, so this is what I'm going to show. So I'm dividing by Q over two, and what am I getting? So rather than having my ciphertext being an integer between minus Q over two and Q over two, now it's going to be a real number or a rational number um, in, the, in the segment minus one to one. So uh, it's going to be a vector of, of elements of absolute value at most one. Um, and uh, uh, now looking at the ciphertext, um, let's start from the end. So Q times I becomes two times I because I'm dividing by Q over two. Uh, this small noise now, become, now becomes a much tinier noise. It's gonna be an epsilon that is much smaller than one. Um, as the, initial, the, initial, uh, the initial noise is going to be proportional to this uh, alpha factor. Um, and decryptability, I'm going to get decryptability so long as this epsilon is smaller than one half. And uh, you may wonder why my M here did not get scaled down. Um, I'm, uh, so we know that we can divide without sort of affecting the message bit. I'm not gonna get into that, but it's not really, it's not really an issue. You can do that without, uh, without affecting your message. So this is the scale-independent fully homomorphic encryption, and the hardness assumption is essentially uh, the same hardness assumption as before because we didn't do anything. We just took our ciphertext and divided it by Q over two. So um, why, why do I say that this, that this scheme actually makes multiplication, uh, uh, multiplicative homomorphism uh, uh, sort of easier? So now multiplicative homomorphism, again, it's going to be a tensor product of the two ciphertexts, mod two. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, I, I argue that when I uh, decrypt this uh, tensored ciphertext using a tensored secret key, then uh, I get an encryption of M1 times M2. So uh, I'm going to start by, by breaking, breaking the, ten, the inner product in the same way, and again, uh, assigning the, the expressions from above to, to these parentheses. And it's going to be very tempting to say, well, because this is mod two, I can just ignore this two times I1 and two times I2, but actually modular arithmetic does not work the same way for reals as it does for, for integers. So for example, one half mod two times two mod two does not equal to one mod two. So, so we can't really do that. We need to carry these, these around and just open the parentheses like this. And what you get is indeed M1 times M2 plus epsilon one times M2 plus two times I2. And again, a symmetric term with epsilon two plus um, epsilon one times epsilon two, all of this mod two. So um, we indeed get M1 times M2, but let's see how our noise uh, um, um, got affected. So first of all, this t term epsilon one times epsilon two is now of the order of uh, something like alpha squared. So this is tiny. Uh, this is not like before where this term kind of squared things and made things, things worse. Here this term is, is, uh, is not going to be significant at all, um, but rather this term uh, is going to be the, the more meaningful one, and we have something like alpha times the absolute value of m plus two times i. Now, uh, in order to bound this m plus two times i, we just go back to this equation and see that m plus two times i is more or less just this, the absolute value of this inner product. And since all the elements of the vector c are between minus one and one, then this thing is going to be smaller than the L1 norm of our secret key vector s. So this thing is smaller than alpha times uh, L1 norm of s. 
and we get that our noise uh, at every point blows up by uh, this, this term, which is still not good enough because uh, our uh, secret key is a vector uh, over ZQ, so it's elements between minus Q over two and Q over two, and the L1 norm is something like N times Q. But this is somewhat easy to fix using a known trick. So instead of uh, looking at, uh, at S as N elements over ZQ, I'm going to decompose it into bits. So my new S is going to be just N log Q bits. Um, and I have a slide on that, but not, not enough time to show it. So it is possible to sort of uh, decompose my secret key into bits and again make uh, a change in the ciphertext. So my ch ciphertext now is also going to be of dimension n log q, uh, but nothing, nothing else really changes. And once I, uh, once I uh, represent my secret key like that, I get the L1 norm uh, is smaller than uh, n log q, and what you get is that uh, your noise blows up by a factor that is something like n log q, or since q is at most two to the n, uh, your noise blows blow up as at most n squared, um, regardless regardless of the scale. So if you do it d times, then your noise will blow up by an, a multiplicative factor of something like n to the d. And this allows to use uh, Gentry's bootstrapping uh, and get fully homomorphic encryption. So bootstrapping essentially means that it's sufficient to evaluate circuit of depth something like log d. And this means that uh, you need to take your alpha in order to allow decryptability for this depth your alpha needs to be something like n to the minus O of log n, and this is regardless of the Q that you're using. So regardless of Q, so long as this is your alpha, uh, you're going to get full homomorphism. And uh, in BGV, you could get something similar to that, but only for very special values of Q. And since we can, since we can do it for any Q, we can actually get classical hardness reductions uh, for some uh, um, lattice problems that were only known before in, in, a quantum, in a quantum way, because this Q actually, uh, taking a large enough Q will actually gives you a classical as opposed to quantum uh, hardness reduction. So um, scale independence give you fully homomorphic encryption without module switching. Uh, the homomorphic properties are independent of Q, but there is some underlying Q that, that governs the security properties. Um, all the properties of BGV and a little more extend, and uh, hopefully it's uh, somewhat simpler to, to understand. Um, I will also refer you to a blog post with Boaz Barak that uh, sort of tries to describe the full, sch full scheme that is based on, uh, on this paper. And I, like when people ask me what's a good place to start on homomorphic encryption, this is where I, I point them. Um, and I even created like a short URL for it. Um, and this is really the end of crypto. Uh, thank you, and I'm going to put the URLs back.